believe that there are some keys to getting prayers answered in the spirit. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you are tired of prayers being unanswered, you need to pay attention to what I'm preaching to you tonight because I'm going to give you something that gives you a key on how to get prayers answered from God. There was a very powerful prophet that lived back in the 50s and 60s, died way too young. His name was Verbal Bean. He was a very powerful man of God. He was a man of prayer. He, he was a powerful powerful man of prayer. He said there were two types of prayers that God answers. He said there are two types of praying that will get God's attention. He said the first type of prayer that God answers is a memorial prayer. It's something that you pray about over and over and over and then God answers it. He said like Cornelius when he prayed so many times that the angel of the Lord said your prayer and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. He said it was like this. He said, if a man wanted to buy a suit, but could not afford the suit, he would go into the suit store with the money he had and put the suit on layaway with the funds that he had. Next time he got paid, he would put some more funds down on the suit. He would not leave with the suit. He would leave without the suit each time he went in to make a payment. But the more payments he made on the suit, when he could make them, there would become a day when he would finally pay off the suit suit and when the last payment was made he could take what he had been paying for home with him he said that's how it is in your prayer life you can be praying about something over and over and over and not take the answer home if you keep praying and you keep believing there's gonna come a day when you bring the answer home with you because you've paid it in full hallelujah Everyone that was involved with our community outreach yesterday, it was an incredible success. We touched over a thousand people yesterday and may have been even more than that. And so many just feeling the love of God and having a chance to inter interact with us. And so many beautiful people here today. One of the most wonderful part of Easter is that everybody wears something special. So look at your neighbor and say, you look amazing. And thankful that we have people, I think, in every section of our balconies today. And so we welcome you, whether you're here early or whether you had to press your way up into the balconies. We are glad. That is a wonderful part of, of this day. Also, many people coming, many guests. Thank you for being here. Our mission is really simple. We honor God. We put Him first in everything. Number two is really close to number one is that we love people. We know that He loves us, and so now we want to share that love with you. And then finally, there is something supernatural that happens when people of faith come together. It's the power to transform the world. I'd like you to open your Bibles with, with me if you have your Bibles today to the book of Luke. If you don't, it's okay. We have these amazing screens behind me. It should be in a big enough font for everyone to read book of Luke chapter number 24 Luke chapter number 24 verse number 13 and behold two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs seven miles and they talked together of all those things which had happened and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they could, should not know him. What manner of communications are these as you have one another, with one another, as you walk and are sad? One of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? What things? Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. Verse 21, everyone say, but. But we trusted that it had been he which should have, everyone say, should have, redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day 
since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Now if you will turn with me to the book of First Peter chapter number 1. This will be a very short reading. First Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, which prophesied of the grace that should come unto you searching what what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow everyone say the glory unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the holy ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into so we see the pattern in luke 23 christ should have suffered and entered into his glory in first peter we see the same pattern again the prophets testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory everyone say and the glory which should follow i'm going to talk to you for a few minutes get ready for the glory would you pray with me father thank you lord for your word thank you lord for your spirit thank you for these wonderful people in this house today i ask you god to draw us draw us for if your spirit does not draw us then my words are in vain lord jesus and i pray pour out your spirit upon us for everyone that is hungry and thirsty today that lives be completely transformed in jesus name amen the lord bless you, you may be seated Look at somebody and say, get ready for the glory. So often, people preach a partial gospel. They only emphasize one part of the story. And half-truth, preached as whole truth, is really not truth at all. I want you to understand the gospel. It is very simple. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that this is what was told him from the original apostles and this is what he now is affirming to them as the final apostle that is speaking now to the Gentiles. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures this is the gospel this is the good news he died he was buried and he rose again the third day everybody say death, death. say burial. burial say resurrection that is the gospel now, so often, people will only emphasize one part. Sometimes we just focus on the cross. Many times, this is where mainstream Christianity just stops. They leave Jesus on the cross. There's many people that wear crucifixes. I'm not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with that. But oftentimes, if you just keep him on the cross, you only get one part of the gospel. Yes, he did die for your sins. But guess what? He's not on the cross anymore. When you see him on the cross, you identify with the fact that we are sinners, that we have failed, and that we could not save ourselves because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is that glory that they're talking about? The glory of what God reveals to us is the ultimate life. 
the glory that was given to, first given to Moses when he came down from the mountain with, with a new lifestyle for them, the Ten Commandments and then the tabernacle plan. And here his face is shining so bright, they say you need to cover it up. That's the glory of God. But yet, we could not keep those laws. We could not measure up to what God expected out of us. We could not be holy by ourselves. And so the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We've all sinned. We couldn't save ourselves. So we look at the cross. We see Jesus as the one taking our place in the punishment. So we don't have to be punished because he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There is a lot to preach about when you talk about him on the cross. And that is glorious. But let me tell you, there's more to the gospel than just Jesus on the cross. The Bible says that they nailed the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. They nailed them to that cross. In other words, everything that sin brought into the world, every sin that would ever be committed, he took that upon himself, upon that cross. One hand is pointing this way, all the way back to the beginning of time. The other hand is pointing this way, all the way to the end of time. And every sin that has ever been done was being done or would ever be done. He said, I'm taking care of all of it right now on this cross. That's why we call it good news. But the burial means that he took all of that with him to the grave and he buried it once and for all. It's one thing to know that you sinned and that somebody took your place, but it's something else to know that those sins can be completely taken away. It's something to know that the nature that you had that would make you repeat those sins, that he can also change your your nature that that old part of you that you don't want can be completely buried and it can be completely removed so not only does Jesus deal with our S-I-N-S's our sins but he also deals with our S-I-N our sin nature the burial is about a thorough work of complete transformation of him saying, I'm going to bury it. I'm going to be dead for three days. It's not just going to be for a few minutes. So you think, well, maybe that was a fluke or maybe he was just unconscious or maybe they didn't know that he was really dead or they thought he was really dead and he really wasn't. But really three days and three nights with a guard posted outside, he's really dead. Touch somebody say, he was really dead. That was the consequence for sins. Now here's the reality that Jesus gives us a New Testament. What does that mean? It is like a last will in Testament. It's what he is willing to us. What he desires to give to us. The terms of our agreement when we are family. So what am I leaving to my children? I am leaving this wonderful promise. I am showing you a brand new life that is free from sin and free from sin nature so that you can walk in a liberty and abundance that you have never known before. But how many understand that the will and testament does not go into effect until when? until you die and so when he was buried it puts the testament into effect now to make sure that it was measured out exactly the way he said in his last will and testament he decided that he would rise again and be the his own executor of his own will for you and i and he gives us the power of his spirit to live on the inside of us the death the burial, and the resurrection. That is the gospel. Resurrection oftentimes is, is, is what we skip to. We skip past sometimes the cross. We skip past the burial. And we just want to go to the good stuff. 
We want to go to the power and the blessing and the, and the excitement. We want to go to the healing and the deliverances and the devils no longer being able to torment us. And we want to talk about all of these supernatural things. But can I tell you something? You cannot have the glory without the suffering. You cannot have a resurrection without a death. And so oftentimes we, we are caught in between. We, we get lost in either the agony of his suffering and his passion. And, and we experience that and we see that and, and we are aghast because we realize that what was on that cross was a reflection of, of what sin looks like. And, and that's a, a picture of us. And we can just stop there. We can feel the finality of the grave when the stone is rolled away and he is buried there and there's a feeling of loss. And this is exactly where we find these two disciples in Luke chapter 24 is that we saw him crucified and we saw him buried, but, but we're, we're stuck right here because there was this anticipation that there was something else that was going to happen and it never seemed to be fulfilled. And so if you just have suffering... Or if you just try to talk about resurrection, but if you don't put those together, then somehow you miss the meaning of what it's really all about. Because guess what? This is all for us. Everything that Jesus went through is for us. He knew that we would have pain, that we would have suffering. He knew that we would have wounds. He knew that we would have things that we couldn't deal with by ourselves. He knew that there was no way for us to, to be able to quantify life and all of its mysteries uh, how many have ever asked the question why is there suffering in the world how many have ever asked why is there disease or why is there sickness or why do people die before their time or how come that person which was such a good person what died in the in the wreck and the guy that was not so good of a person seemed to survive it why is it that there are wars and why are, why are people able to get away with stuff? And, and, and the psalmist David talked about that. He said, my foot almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I didn't understand. It seems like there's so many things that, that don't make sense in the world. Jesus bore all of that complexity. And so when we talk about his sufferings, we're talking about someone that's doing this for us. He was bruised for us. He was beaten for us. He did that for me. If you don't understand resurrection, however, it seems to be for nothing. Why is this man who was perfect who preached so beautifully, who mesmerized thousands of people on the hillsides, who broke bread and gave it to the multitudes, and the fish just kept multiplying in the baskets, and the cripples were healed, and the devils were cast out, and why did the Sanhedrin crucify him? Why did the Romans do this, and why did God allow it? I don't understand. I trusted. I thought before resurrection, suffering has no meaning. Without, without understanding resurrection today, what you are going through in your life seems to be a waste. Why am I going through this? This is why we do everything possible to avoid any inconveniences. Because we look at suffering as a total waste. How many of you have pushed the elevator button like 50 times? As if pushing it four more times might make it come faster. How many of you have been in a fast food line and there's been three cars ahead of you and you're going, come on! You're already in a fast food line! We stand up for a half hour. My feet hurt. <laughs> Caleb was trying to tell us that he had a cramp in his leg. <laughs> He's four. How do you get a cramp in your leg? <laughs> I 
And then suddenly, I'm too tired, carry me. And of course, both of my kids want me to carry them up 14 stairs because they just simply don't want to climb them. When they get up there, they're amazingly re-energized. <laughs> I'm honest with you. I, I, I don't particularly like pain. I mean, we, even, even the idea of going to the dentist, we kind of go, can we schedule it? There's a problem. Uh, just something. Let's reschedule that for another. Oh, they have gas? They have something? That, and then they call it laughing gas to kind of ease your mind, you know. I'll be laughing while they're cutting on me, you know. <laughs> I'll be laughing so much I won't know how painful it really is. This is what we do. We do everything possible to, to avoid it because in our minds, it seems to have no value or no worth to us. It seems to be a waste. Anything that might inconvenience me or affect me or have any pain or... And so this is the mindset, hey, if he's the king, if this is the son of God, if this is the son of David, if he could go into a temple with a whip and clean it out, if he could turn over the money changers and, and he could tell them, my father's house is a house of prayer. I mean, they were like, yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. This is what the disciples were waiting on. I mean, they were high-fiving. You know they were. I mean... Andrew and Peter were bam, 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 boom. We have been waiting for three years for this. And the week passed, and they crucified him. Every time he would talk about suffering, they would rebuke him. He gave Peter the keys, told him, I'm going to build my church. You're going to be one of the founding members of it. You're going to help me start it. All right, I got the keys of the kingdom. I can bind and I can loose. And he says, and the Son of Man is going to be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And he's going to be punished. And he's going to die. And oh, now Peter, who's got the keys, <laughs> now I am duly qualified to rebuke the master. Be it far from thee, Lord. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You savor the things that be of man and not the things that be of God. He's going to stop the redemption of mankind right now. He's going to stand in the way of Calvary. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But they don't get this. They don't understand. They think you should use your power to squash your enemies. But that's not what Jesus does. He turns enemies into friends by saying, I'll take all the enmity and I'll take all the hatred and I'll take all of the failures and I'll take all the weaknesses. I'll take them all on the cross and, and I'll say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You don't get this. You don't understand all the suffering is for redemption is to deliver us from the consequences of what we could not deliver ourselves from. Oh. And so they're talking about this. We thought, we thought, we trusted, we hoped, we anticipated, and Jesus joins the conversation already resurrected. And he's walking along with them. What are you all talking about, guys? Well, we're just talking about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh-huh. And the things that happened in Israel, yeah, yeah. What things? Did you get it? Do you understand? Have you figured out that I'm here? Did you know what this is really all about? Have you grasped the whole purpose of this? There is no context for suffering. There is no understanding of why we go through what we go through until Jesus shows up in the conversation with us. Nothing in your life is going to make sense until Jesus shows up in the conversation. And a lot of times we're talking about him and what he really wants is us to talk with him. Tell me what's going on. We trusted and we feel let down. Is there anybody here that thought life was going to be different than how it turned out? Has anybody had anticipation? I thought my life was going to be this, and it turned out to be that. And even the 
most well-intentioned people that, that love each other. They go through trouble in their, in their relationships. Even, even kids that are amazing kids frustrate their parents. They're even, there are even people that, that, that go through life and, and, and things don't seem to work out the way that they expect. Sickness or disease shows up and I wasn't planning on that. You lose a job that you thought you would always have. You, things happen. And what, and what we often do is say, God, why? Why did you let this happen? And we're talking about it. And our hearts are, 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 are heavy because we don't understand the full picture. We're only seeing one side or the other. And so if somebody just tells you about resurrection, that seems unreachable to you. It seems unfathomable to you. Somebody talks to you about the Holy Ghost, and it doesn't seem to make sense because where you are, you're in the stage of the suffering. And those people over there are talking about something that can't possibly be true. And so if you're just seeing one side or the other, you miss it. But the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And when it all comes together in your life, it'll suddenly make sense. And Jesus says, wait a minute, there's another part of the story. Can I tell somebody here today, if you're in suffering, get ready for the glory. Because the glory always follows the suffering. God put this in my spirit and I have been praying about this for, for months really leading up to this service today that the Lord said there's a lot of people that are in pain that are not understanding their pain. There's a lot of people that are in a process of suffering and don't understand their suffering and they feel like they are stuck. He said I don't want you just to talk one side of it. He said I want you to tell them everything. I want you to tell them that the suffering is going to take them to the glory. I don't want you just to know that he identifies with your suffering but I want you to know that he can bury your past. He can bury all the issues. He can put it all to rest. He can silence the voice. And he can then fill you with his spirit. And you will really understand what the glory of God is all about. Thank you, Jesus. He chides them, oh fools and slow of heart to believe all that was written about me in the scriptures. You're slow of heart. You're not processing very fast when you're hurting and you're disillusioned, you don't process very well. When you're emotional, you tend to not hear. You get about every fourth word. It's like there's a half mute button on people. You. And the person said, I love you, and all you saw was a finger and them saying, you. People can be so living in their pain and their offense that they walk around and they assume that everybody is after them and everybody knows what this thing is. And, 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 and it seems to be a running commentary of life. And the guy at the convenience store that you wanted to buy your coffee from, He looks past you to somebody else and you didn't know that there was another line and oh, and now, yeah. This is what I get. This is how my life is. You know, it seems that these, and, and, and we get into this, we can't even hear. And Jesus is trying to say, I'm here. Ta-da! So what are you talking about, guys? Jesus, yes, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Yet yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. Wonderful. And they're looking around. Their, their eyes were holding. They couldn't even see him. They, he was right in front of them. They, they couldn't grasp it because they're, they're, they're not knowing how to process their pain. It doesn't have meaning to them. It doesn't have meaning to them. It seemed to be a waste. And now they're disappointed. Now they're let down. How could you get any value or worth out of a cross? How? I don't understand. And he stops and says, ought not Christ to have suffered and then afterwards entered into his glory? This was something that was already written about. It was already talked about. In other words, I'm changing the whole context of the human condition with one act on the cross. 
This has been prophesied for generations and millennia that the Messiah, the Messiah was going to suffer and then afterwards enter into the glory. He was going to show us the pathway to the glory. Suffering leads to glory. Would you say that with me? Say suffering leads to glory. What Jesus did on that cross, what Jesus did on that cross, when he, rebu when he refused the gall, what he was saying is, I don't want to be desensitized on, be on the cross. Don't give me something that will make me half drunk on the cross. I don't want that. I, I'm rejecting that. I want to feel, because that's what this is about. I'm supposed to feel. Oh, no, no, we're not supposed to feel. That's, that's how human beings are because we don't have understanding for what's going on. But when Jesus shows up in our conversation, he says, can I show you something else? And they sit down at the table with him and he blesses the food. And as he does, he breaks the bread. And the Bible says their eyes were open that they knew him. Why? They saw the scars in his hands. And all of a sudden they went, wow, it's really him. It's not wounds anymore now. Now there's scars. It's Jesus in a glorified body. He can walk through walls. He can eat and then disappear at will. His body is not the same. In other words, he was still every bit human, but he was now glorified. And as a glorified man resurrected from the dead, he was showing them what glory looks like. That when you have the glory of God in your life, walls aren't there that used to be there. Limitations in your life that you used to have are not there anymore. The same things that you struggle with all of your life, they are not there. He said, I'm going to show you that I conquered it. These aren't wounds anymore. They're scars. Is there anybody in the house today that's got some wounds? Let me bring you to a resurrected Savior who's going to show you his scars and say there is glory after the suffering. Let me finish this now. And so Peter, who was there with him through all of his passion, and who preached on the day of Pentecost about the power, he, at the end of his life, begins to share with them again. And he says, we have an inheritance that's incorruptible, it's undefiled, and that fades not away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. We are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to reveal, be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What he is saying is, there's a seasons of life that you go through where you're tested, but there's a purpose. There's something that he's working out in you. Something is happening. It's going to be praise and glory at the end of this story and he's talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ who having not seen ye love in whom thou ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory so what he is saying is our human condition has been radically changed now. That even when we are tested and even when we are tried, we are rejoicing because we realize that a transformation is going on as a result of what's happening in our lives. And we have the end of our faith, which is the, the Holy Spirit. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, can I tell you that I, it, 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 it's something you just have to experience to understand. Peter just said it's unspeakable. I, I can't even give you a word for it. I can't even define it or describe it. But I can say it to you in this context. I've never met one person that ever, met, er, that ever received the Holy Spirit speaking with other tongues and ever regretted it. Not one. Every time they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they go, wow, so that's what it's all about. Wow, 
Oh, that's amazing. Oh my goodness, I wish I would have got this years ago. Now I, I understand. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And then he talks about the prophets. And what did they do? They prophesied and they testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that administer the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now notice this, and I close with this. Which things the angels desire to look into? Wait a minute. Of all the kingdoms of this world, angels aren't impressed. All the political power, all the wealth, angels aren't impressed. But there's something. When we believe the gospel, when we obey his death, his burial, his resurrection, as Peter preached it on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the gospel. Repentance identifies with his, with his cross. Baptism represents his, his burial. And then resurrection is the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. The angels observe this, and they say, I wish I could be a part of that. Wow. Why is that? Lucifer was covered with every precious stone. He had pipes and tabrets on the inside of him. Music played out of him. He was a sum of perfection, the Bible says, full of wisdom. When he would sing, he would, he would literally be a covering cherub that would be around the throne of God. His, his wings would cover around the throne of God and the glory of the Lord would hit that angelic being and all of those beautiful stones that were all around him would light up and refract in beautiful spectrums of colors all the heavens. And then music would play out of him and the angels would rejoice and celebrate around the throne of God. Absolutely amazing. That's what he was designed for. That was what he was made to do. And then one day, the one who inspired worship for God said, you know what? I'd like to inspire worship for myself. I'd like to be a God alongside of the God. And he found out there was only room for one God. And he was cast down like lightning from heaven. Pow! Just like that. You want to know how big the difference is between God and the devil? How long did it take God to deal with him? About as long as it takes for lightning to flash. That's, that's about how long it takes. Not even in the same class. God doesn't have an opposite. The opposite of Lucifer is the Archangel Michael. They're in the same class. But there's no class. There's no, there's no opposite of God. And then God makes this man out of the dust. and He's not nearly as beautiful and not covered with any precious stones. And yet, he gives him this life, breathes into him, makes him in his image and in his likeness. And Lucifer hates him. And so he says, I'm going to get back at God by, I can't directly attack him. It's not a contest, but I can get him to use his own principles against something that he loves. So I'm going to deceive this man and woman, and I'm going to get them to fail just like I failed, and say they're gods just like I was a god. Because that was when they discovered, that's when the angels found out what makes God angry. They'd never seen God judge anything or anyone until Lucifer lifted himself up against God. And judgment came so swift and fast that hell, everlasting fire, was prepared for the devil and his angels that day. Wow, they had never seen anything so fierce. That's why the Bible says, Thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They remember that day. And so he's saying, well, if I'm going there, I'm going to try to bring somebody else with me. I'm going to try to bring this new creature that God made, this man. I'm going to get him to do the same things. He knows that if you eat of this fruit, you'll be a god. See what happens after that. That's what's in Lucifer's mind. 
The woman eats and then gives to the man. And then here comes God. And I'm telling you, Lucifer is saying, here it comes. Here comes the lightning crack. Here comes the anger. Here comes the, the, here comes the, the, the fury of God. And God walks in and goes, Adam, where are you? I I'm here. The place we always meet when we go for our walks every day. I Adam! Adam! I'm afraid and I hid myself. Did you eat from that tree? Yeah, I did. The woman gave it to me. Did you give it to him? Yes, but I got it from the serpent. Where is that serpent? And the judgment comes on the serpent and a prophecy comes to the woman. One born of the woman will crush that serpent under his foot. It'll bruise his head. It'll bruise his heel, but it will crush that serpent's head. And Lucifer is in shock. Wait a minute. What? There's no lightning flash and the angels lean in? What? There's no certain judgment? You see, when Lucifer fell, there was nothing in him worth saving. But when man fell, God said, I love you too much to send you away forever. I will do whatever it takes to bring you back to me. When Lucifer fell, it was the first time the angel saw judgment. But when man fell, it was the first time they ever saw mercy. They didn't know mercy existed in the heart of God until human beings were made. Can I tell you something? We serve a God that says, I'll bear with you through your suffering. I'll stay with you through your mistakes. I'll walk this journey with you. I'll even go to a cross for you. I'll even bury, be buried for three days for you. And I'll resurrect the third day so you can have an opportunity and a second chance at life. Lucifer didn't get a second chance. The angels that fell with him don't get a second chance. But you and I, no matter how many times we fail, we can get a second chance. Stand with me all over this building. So I want to tell somebody here today, don't let your suffering be in vain. Don't let your pain produce nothing in your life. It only has meaning if it brings you to Jesus. If it doesn't bring you to Jesus, you're missing out. But here today, very simple prayer we can pray together can start you on this journey. Repentance is not a bad thing. <laughs> angels wish they could. No repentance for angels. No second chances for angels. Second chances for us. Repentance is the right to start over. Simple prayer. It's just a prayer of saying, God, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. I need a second chance. Once you've asked Him to forgive you, Holy Ghost comes so easy and so quick. Because God doesn't just leave you empty. He'll fill you up with His Spirit. The same faith that you use for forgiveness is the same faith you use for the Holy Ghost. If you can believe that He will forgive you, the same faith you use to receive forgiveness, okay, now I can receive the Spirit. Are you ready? Just close your eyes right where you're standing right now. Why don't you just pray with me? I'll help you. Say, Lord Jesus, I have a lot of wounds, a lot of things I don't want to talk about. Some things have been done to me. Some things have just happened in the course of life. Some things I've done to myself. But I'm ready to move from suffering to glory. I'm ready to have meaning in my life again. I'm asking you, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, let me start over right now. Not by my strength, but by your strength. I forgive every person that's ever hurt me. And I thank you, Lord, that today 
you're walking with me. You're right here by me. And you're ready to show me your glory. Empty me out of everything that does not belong in Jesus' name. And now fill me up with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now in your own words, lift your hands to the Lord and just thank Him for forgiveness. Would you do that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the balconies all across this building, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Give it to him. Give it to him, that question. That thought of why. Yes. There are some of you here today, I know it's Easter, but you're feeling compelled to come forward. You want, to, you want more from God. I want you to come right now. I want you to come and stand. People will come and pray with you. They'll come and help you. If you're ready to enter into the glory, the suffering is going to lead you to the glory. The pain is going to take you to where the power is. His passion on that cross was so that you could be free today, so that you could be healed today. If you need to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus, we have people here to help you. They'll be happy to baptize you in the wonderful name of Jesus and you can bury that past. If you want the Holy Spirit, come on. You can receive it so easily. God will fill you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. If you're ready to go, God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. We love you. Next week, don't forget Family Sunday. Bring as many family members as you can. It'll be a great day, an awesome day. Second type of prayer is a current prayer. He said a current prayer is the second type of prayer that God answers. It's, it's a situation that you do not have, you don't have a long time for God to do this. You need God to do it now. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, you can have a lost loved one. You can, that's a memorial thing. You just pray until God does something. But you could have a situation where you need God to intervene now. And when you have that type of prayer, memorial prayer is not what you need. You can't just go bring the name up or bring the situation up in passing and say, God, I'm making another payment on this. I need you to come through. When the situation is desperate, it requires desperation in your prayers. A current prayer. You can't come with a situation, Brother Grant, that's tragic and real and severe and come to God and give God a, you know, Lord, what we're going through right now. And I need you to come through because the deadline is this week and we have to an answer. We need some peace. We need a miracle and walk out. That's, there's no desperation there. You're giving God the right facts, but you're not giving God the heart behind the facts. You're showing God, I'm really not serious about this. Because a current prayer requires desperation. It requires you to be, I need an answer now. I don't have 60 years to pray about this. We need a miracle in our house. That is desperation. That's a current prayer. And a current prayer, God will hear. And I want to show you something. That, that the Lord answers prayers while you're praying them. I know that we've got God in this box that if I pray today, he can come through by Thursday or he can come through by tomorrow. He can come through by next month. But actually God, the Bible said, I can hear you before you even say what you're going to say. In fact, I need Jesus. I know what you're saying before you even ask. Yeah.